I was so glad to see that this was how we worked. And you know, you think about it, we really bit off an impossible thing. We're supposed to like write and learn and perform new songs all in the period of like about a month or something. So um, <laughs> it was like, strictly speaking, a little bit impossible. Uh, how highly would you rate your own music? We don't rate it. We don't sort of compare it and classify it like everybody else. Yeah. We're, not, we're not very good musicians, you know, and we never claim to be very good musicians. We're, we're adequate, but not very good. We're not, we're not very good musicians, you know, and we never claim to be very good musicians. We're, we're adequate, but not very good. Well, what's the reason, do you think, for the uh, tremendous popularity? Is it because well, people admire your talent, or...? Well, I don't know, you know, maybe they re uh, <coughs> admire adequate music. You know. John, when you started out and, and, and became the Beatles as a group, you were then writing songs with Paul. Did you at that time have as your goal, your ambition to be a successful group, or did you really think it was songwriting that mattered? Uh, it was it was the group thing mainly at first, because uh, anyway to get sell the songs you, you can't sort of get, you know, you've got to send them to some little publisher otherwise, you know, who never looks at them. So we, we, all, we always concentrated on the group really. Did you at any one stage come to the point where you said, Heavens above, we're, we're successful as composers and we shall be more successful as composers than we'll ever be as musicians. I can't remember a point, but I know it, there is some sort of, must have been some time when it suddenly dawned on us, but I can't remember it. Well, in fact, when you are faced with a situation of having to turn something out, do you then try running over phrases on a guitar that have been going through your mind for some time, seeing what you can Yeah, we, <laughs> that's another trick, <laughs> to try so, an old song. Yes. You know, one that never quite made it, and take a bit out of it that was wasn't bad, yeah, there was and doctorate. try and make yeah, and try and make that into a song. Yes. Did you t store away in your minds odd phrases that you hear from time to time that would make a good title? Well, I think I try to, but I always forget them. If they're stored away in my mind, they might come back without me knowing. Because there's bits from other records, I think I'll pinch that, and I'll never remember it. Well, you jumped in very quickly there, John. Does this mean that you're the words expert in particular? No. You know, it's, <laughs> I find it just as hard words or music. You both have to be in the right mood when you, you, you're working together, collaborating on a song. Yeah. Does one have to wait for the other to, uh, to Very start? seldom, you know. If we both don't feel like it, we just have another ciggy. And if, if, if one does, does, does the other say, well, well wait we, till next week? The only time we've got to do that, when we've got to actually sort of force ourselves to write it is when we've got an LP coming up or we've yes. got a film coming up or something and uh, then it's a bit it's a bit of a drag for the first say two songs because you really got to you know in fact the last LP <laughs> wow we took weeks just trying to get one written you know to get back into the swing of it because we don't write in between uh, in between LPs normally maybe just write sort of one or two and then we have a great big batch because we don't write in between uh, in between LPs, normally. Maybe just write sort of one or two, and then we have a great big batch. I'd have thought it was quite impossible, really, to say, right, we've got to write 12 songs for an LP, let's settle down to it. It is some days, and this last time was very impossible, because the, I don't know, okay. holiday spirit. Mm. You know, the sun shining, and, well, it was at the time. In so fact, we tried uh, writing them in the garden then, mm. and then you forget about it, start looking at flowers and trees and things like that, really. I guess he gives you some ideas when you're recording your songs. Do you give him any ideas on his recordings of your Sometimes songs? we go along to the sessions, you know. B gives us more ideas than we give him, I think. Because he's at all of our sessions and we're not at all of his. In fact, I think I've been to one. Did, did you get any particular interest out of the, uh, the bigger lineup that was available to him? Oh, yes, yeah. It's, uh... The only, the only trouble, the main trouble with having big lineups and things is you use session men, and session men are all great technically, but you've got to write exactly what you want out on paper for session men. And so it's easier with us, because you can sort of say to George, no, not that, uh, a bit more like so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, you know, and he'd do it, you know what you meant. But if you said to a session man, no, uh, you know, do it a bit like sort of, uh, you know, well then he'd, he'd need it written down so that's the only big trouble really 
with uh, doing it with big bands, you've got to you've got to know exactly how to write, and it's very mm. difficult to to write bending notes and things on instruments. You know, you can't, and so that's why sometimes the versions by other people can sound a bit square occasionally. Yesterday took the uh, listening public a moment of surprise, I think. It's a bit of a shock to them. You have since then recorded some more with an unusual instrumentation in the backing. Mm. Um, was this inspired by the success of yesterday, or did you do it because you liked it? Well, the, the, see, the, uh, the idea for yesterday, of doing it like that, was because um, we, see, we, we're limited as a group. You know, we're the first to say that we're not all that good anyway, musically. We, see, we, we're limited as a group. You know, we're the first to say that we're not all that good anyway, musically. So that with something like yesterday, the best we could have done with it would have been uh, This Boy or If I Fell. You know, those are sort of, I think, two mm. of the best that we've done like that with a group and still managed to put the song over in the way it should have been. But with Yesterday, uh, it would have just meant either another If I Fell or another This Boy, you know, another Beatles combo doing a slow one, you know. So um, we did it like that and nobody seemed to mind. Least of all us, I think, you know, because we didn't have to play, we didn't have to show ourselves up again <laughs> on record. The only time we've got to do that, when we've got to actually sort of force ourselves to write it, is when we've got an LP coming up or we've yes. got a film coming up or something. And uh, then it's a bit, it's a bit of a drag for the first, say, two songs, because you really got to, you know, in fact, the last LP. <laughs> wow, we took weeks just trying to get one written, you know, to get back into the swing of it, because we don't write in between. Uh, in between LPs, normally. We're, we're limited as a group. You know, we're the first to say that we're not all that good anyway, musically. In the fall of 1965, the Beatles were exhausted. They had just come back from a tour and they were kind of a little tired. And what happened was they cut the tour short and they came back because they had to record an album in time for the Christmas season, right? This was their pattern. Two albums a year, one in time for Christmas, plus a single, plus a flexidisc uh, for their fan club. Well, this time, the Beatles had not been writing material, and they were really empty. Now, in order to get something in the stores by Christmas, you have to have it all wrapped up and recorded by November 11th. The Beatles enter the studio on October 11th, right? 30 days to write, record, and mix an album. Here are the two fundamental problems with Rubber Soul at a glance. One, the ability to write, rehearse, arrange, and record 16 new songs in 30 days is highly unlikely. Two, aside from recording the music, the cycle time to manufacture the record, which includes the creation of the record labels, album art, sleeve design, printing, packaging, and distribution, was not possible based on when recording concluded and the final lacquer was cut. In other words, there was not enough time. And so with that, let's move to slide 14 and let's take a look at problem number one, the ability to write and record 16 new songs in 30 days. Okay, so if you follow my work, this is a version of a slide that you have seen before. It was in my big presentation going back to April of 2020, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? And also the addendum going back to last April of 2023. So I'm going to take you through the 16 songs in 30 days. Now, before we get started, some people want to argue and banter back and forth about whether it was 16 songs or something less. Mark Lewison tells us it was more than a dozen songs. When I was doing the research and putting my big presentation together, I identified two songs that were in partial or draft mode. Those songs were Michelle and We Can Work It Out. The song Wait was not introduced into the Rubber Soul sessions until the tail end of the sessions. It wasn't until they needed one more song to complete the album with 14 tracks. And that's when they brought Wait in. So the song Wait was not in the mix when the Beatles stepped into the studio on October 11th of 1965. In the minds of the Beatles, they had to write 14 songs for the album and two more songs 
for a double A side single. So the song Wait wasn't even on the radar until the very end of the Rubber Soul sessions. Another song that we should talk about is What Goes On, because this is a song that many Beatle fans believe was a song that was complete, already written, and brought into the Rubber Soul sessions. However, when you look into the background of the song, what you'll find is that the version that we hear on Rubber Soul is substantially different than the version of the song that John Lennon allegedly wrote back in 1959. So if you have a song that is substantially different than its initial iteration, that means that the song was rewritten. And rewriting takes time. So after you're done rewriting and revamping the song, then you have to present it to your band members. They have to learn the song, and then they go off and rehearse the song. And once they rehearse, there's going to be changes. There's going to be suggestions and input about, hey, maybe we should do this or do that. And then once those changes are incorporated, you go back, you rehearse the song again until you get to the point where you feel comfortable that you're ready to record it. So What Goes On was not a completed song that the Beatles took into the Rubber Soul sessions. And I would place it in the same category as Michelle and We Can Work It Out, where they were partial songs that required work in order to finish them. So What Goes On was not in the bag when the Beatles came into the studio on October 11th of 1965. Okay, so with that, we have two versions of the official narrative. The prevailing narrative is that the Beatles were writing music all the time. They were a perpetual motion machine of songwriting. Again, they wrote when they were on tour, they wrote when they were on holiday, they wrote when they were on film sets, and they wrote in the studio. And then we have the August 5th, 1966 interview where Paul McCartney said, that's not true. We did not write between LPs normally. Maybe one or two. So what I'm going to do now, as I take you through this chart, is to show you that both those narratives are highly suspect. So let's just start with this baseline. The Beatles, per an agreement between Brian Epstein and George Martin, were responsible for releasing two albums and four singles per year. The singles were released about every three months, while the albums were released every six months. A link to the source for this information is provided in the description box below. So the release of another album during the second half of 1965 was in accordance with the release schedule. So in 1963, the Beatles released Please Please Me and With the Beatles. In 1964, they released A Hard Day's Night and Beatles for Sale. In 1965, they released Help and Rubber Soul. In 66, they released Revolver, and then at the very end of the year, in 1966, they released that very odd album, A Collection of Oldies, which in essence was a greatest hits album from 1963 to 1966. And I don't know many people that would consider a three-year-old song to be an oldie, but that's a discussion for another day. So let's take a moment and take a look at both narratives. And the first one I'm going to look at is Paul's statement from the 1966 BBC interview where he stated that he and John wrote in great big batches whenever they needed to record an album or do a film. And then I'll discuss the narrative that most Beatles fans are more familiar with, which tells us that the Beatles were writing songs all the time. The perpetual motion machine of songwriting. But let's first focus on Paul's statement that they wrote in great big batches and logic through why that approach would be unacceptable. The primary reason is because that approach introduces a tremendous amount of risk into the recording sessions. And what is that risk? It's the risk that the album doesn't get done. The official narrative tells us that the Beatles are operating within a 30-day window. It's finite. And they're coming into the studio with essentially no material. So this is a very high-risk endeavor. There are no guarantees that this record's going to get done. And we would have to believe that 
EMI and George Martin are okay with this approach, basically flying by the seat of their pants and throwing the Hail Mary and hoping you get a touchdown. There is no way that EMI and George Martin are leaving this to chance. So the premise that they're writing, rehearsing, and recording the songs within a 30-day period of time, and they came into the studio with basically a blank sheet of paper, is nonsense. This is why I said earlier that when Paul McCartney said that they wrote in great big batches, what he was really telling us by using the Masonic technique of masterfully speaking is they had to learn the vocals in great big batches so that they can record them. And this will become clearer as I take you through the data. But before I do that, let's swing back to the other narrative regarding this songwriting. And that's the narrative that most Beatles fans are familiar with. The Beatles were writing all the time. So we know the Beatles were obligated to release two albums a year. And according to the They Wrote All the Time narrative, there were no major issues with writing songs to complete the five albums before Rubber Soul. And yes, the preceding albums, aside from A Hard Day's Night, contained cover songs. However, even with the covers, the Beatles were still able to write eight original songs for Please Please Me, eight for With the Beatles, 13 for Hard Day's Night, which were all originals, eight original compositions for Beatles for Sale, and 12 originals for Help. So even with the hectic schedule that they carried from 1962 through 64 and into 65, with their live gigs, including their BBC appearances, tours, films in 64 and 65, recording two albums a year in 63 and 64, and then the Help album in the early part of 1965, they still found time to write songs because we are told they were writing all the time. Yet they came into Rubber Soul, their sixth studio album, with basically no songs. So the key question is, what the heck happened with Rubber Soul? Why were John and Paul not ready with songs. Why did they walk into the sessions with essentially no backlog of music? Was there a massive breakdown in communication? It's not like they didn't know that they were on the hook for a second album in 1965, because they had to do it in 1963, and they had to do it in 1964, and they completed the first album for 1965, Help, earlier in the year. And what about Brian Epstein, who is portrayed as being very meticulous, dotting his I's and crossing his T's, did he not reach out to Paul and John and the rest of the band and ask them how they were coming along with the songwriting because we have a second album due toward the end of the year and we're going to need 12, 14, or 16 songs? Brian wasn't managing them or keeping tabs on how they're progressing? And what about George Martin? Are we to expect that George Martin wasn't speaking to Brian Epstein or even the Beatles themselves, also asking the question, how are we coming along with the songs? Because I've got studio time booked later in the year, and we're going to need 16 songs, lads, 14 for the album, and two more for a single. So for Rubber Soul, it appears that everyone nodded off and went to sleep after the recording of Help. What I'm going to show you is they did not come in empty. The songs were pre-written by outside songwriters and pre-recorded by session players. So when the Beatles came into the studio on October 11th, their job was to learn the vocals in great big batches. And that batch meant 14 songs for the album and two songs for the single. So with that, let me step you through the chart. I'll cover the chronology of when the songs were recorded, start to finish, the elapsed days, starting with when the Beatles entered the studio on October 11th, the number of takes for each song, as well as other activities that took place during the 30 days. And once I break it down, I'm hoping that it becomes obvious that both narratives are highly suspect and that something else was going on with the recording of Rubber Soul. Okay, so let's focus on the right-hand side of the chart, and I'm going to try to move through this as quickly as I can. What I did was to break down the Rubber Soul sessions by month. We have October and November. 
And we know that the Beatles came into EMI Studios on October 11th of 1965, and they came in with essentially no backlog of music. So they come in on October 11th, and the very next day on October 12th, they finish recording Run For Your Life. And they did that in five takes. So Run For Your Life had to be written, learned by the other Beatles so that they knew how to play the song, and then rehearsed to the point where they were ready to record. So all of that took place within 24 hours. And when you see an asterisk next to the song, that means that recording began and concluded on the very same day. So on October 13th, two days in, the Beatles nail Drive My Car in four takes. Now, the number of takes is going to be a very important variable with regard to the believability factor of the official narrative. And I'll get to that in a moment. On October 16th, five days in, the Beatles finished Day Tripper in three takes. On October 18th, seven days in, they finished If I Needed Someone, and they did that in one take. On October 21st, 10 days in, they finished recording Norwegian Wood, and they did that in five takes. Now, I'm not going to go through every song. You can pause the video and you can take a look at the data yourself. But the rate and pace in which these songs are being knocked out is completely unrealistic. If I had to use an analogy, it's like the Beatles are a printing press, just turning out these songs like a machine. And remember the process. You have to write the songs, then you have to teach the songs to the rest of the band, then they have to rehearse their parts to make sure they've got them down. And usually what happens when you go through that piece of the process is there are going to be changes because somebody's going to say, hey, why don't we try this or why don't we do that? So then you make alterations to the song and then you go back to rehearsing and you continue to rehearse until you have it down to the point where you feel comfortable that you can record it. The other problem with this rate and pace and the progression of this songwriting is that it says that everything that the Beatles started, they finished. Everything they touched turned to gold. There were no false starts. There were no false starts with the music or the lyrics. Everything just magically came together. And that, my friends, is not reality. The Beatles are not writing these songs and they are not laying down the instrumental tracks. The Beatles' job was to learn the vocals so they can record them and then George Martin could marry the vocals with the instrumental tracks and complete the songs. Now, if we take a look at November 11th, I talked about this earlier in the presentation. This is where the Beatles had that marathon session that Mark Lewison told us about, and they finished recording four songs on the very last day, two of which, we're told, didn't exist before November 11th. That would be You Won't See Me and Girl. The song Wait, as we discussed, was pulled in from the help sessions, allegedly. And the fourth song, I'm Looking Through You, the narrative tells us that recording began back on November 6th, and it was finished up on November 11th. So let's move over to the left-hand side of the slide now, and let me summarize what's going on here. I think it's important that we go back to what Paul said in the August 1966 BBC interview. He said, it's a bit of a drag for the first two songs. In other words, getting them written. The last LP, we took weeks just trying to get one written. So if it took them weeks to get one song written, how were they banging out all these songs within 30 days? Also in the August 1966 interview, Paul states, we're limited as a group. We're the first to say we're not all that good musically. Well, if a band is not all that good musically, how were they nailing the rehearsals and the recording sessions of 16 songs within this time frame? As I mentioned before, the number of takes is a telltale sign that this narrative is fiction. Not one song took more than five takes to record the basic tracks. If we fast forward to the White Album sessions and you take a look at how many takes it took to get those songs recorded, you're looking at dozens, 
20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 takes for many of the songs on the White Album. So a logical question to ask is, if the Beatles had all of this recording prowess back in 1965 for Rubber Soul, what happened three years later during the White Album sessions? How did they go from recording songs in five takes or less for Rubber Soul to recording songs of the White Album that took dozens and dozens of takes? There were six days during the 30 days when no recording was scheduled. One of the six days was due to fan club obligations that they had to attend to. There were two days where mixing took place. There was one day when they stepped out because they received their MBEs. And there were two days tied up with a TV show. So we already started with a very compressed timeline of 30 days. And now it's down to 24 at best. So if we go to the yellow highlighted box, in October, eight songs were recorded in 18 days with a total of 28 takes for all songs. That's an average of three and a half takes per song. In November, the remaining eight songs were recorded in 13 days, with a total of 14 takes, half the number of takes it took them to record eight songs back in October. And that represents an average of 1.8 takes per song. It's not believable. This is not reality. So from October 11th through November 11th, the Beatles were able to nail 16 songs in a total of 42 takes, which is an average of 2.6 takes per song. Eight songs were started and completed on the same day. That's the asterisk I noted earlier. Four songs were completed on the very last day, on November 11th, and I took you through that. Okay, so let's move to slide number 15 now, and let's talk about the manufacturing process to get a record out the door. Okay, so let me walk you through the manufacturing process. And this is an overview. I go into greater detail in my big presentations. Did the Beatles write all their own music and the addendum? And the links will be down below in the description box. So what I did was to break this chart down into three parts. Part one is November 11th through the 16th, where recording ends. George Martin does the final editing. The songs are mixed down. The run times are established and the sequencing is completed. And as I take you through this, you're going to see that the sequencing piece of this presents a very big problem for the Rubber Soul narrative. Now, the cycle time to manufacture an album going back into the 1960s was two months or more, so eight plus weeks. And the starting point for the eight weeks is when the final lacquer is cut. In the case of Rubber Soul, the first mono lacquer was cut on November 17th of 1965, and EMI needed to get Rubber Soul out into the retail outlets by December 3rd of 1965. So from November 17th, when the first mono lacquer was cut, to December 3rd is 17 calendar days. Yet the typical cycle time, as I just mentioned, is eight weeks or more. So we'll just use eight weeks for the sake of argument. That's 56 calendar days. So George Martin and EMI took 56 days down to 17. That's a cycle time reduction of 70%. So the question to ask is an obvious one. How were they able to do that? Now, what I did in my presentations to give George Martin and EMI the benefit of the doubt that they would pull out all the stops to get Rubber Soul out to retail by December 3rd when the mono lacquer was cut on November 17th was to say that Maybe they can do this in six weeks. And six weeks represents 42 calendar days. So George Martin and EMI still took the cycle time down by 60%, 42 days down to 17. And the question still stands, how did they do that? Now, for those of you who haven't watched my big presentations and are asking, how do I know the cycle time? It's because when I was researching did the Beatles write all their own music leading into April of 2020 when I released it? I was working with a source who has been in the music industry for decades, and they are very familiar with the vinyl pressing process. So this person told me that starting from when the lacquer is cut, the final lacquer, it's a two-month or better process. And so I asked, well, what if EMI did everything they could to expedite the process 
what would be the minimum amount of time to get that record out of the plant and into the stores. And he said, six weeks. In fact, they told me that the drying time alone for the ink on the album art and the sleeves took a week. So if it takes a week for the album art to dry before it can be handled, and the cycle time was reduced from eight weeks or six weeks down to 17 days, and seven of those 17 days <laughs> required that the album art dry, you can see that there's a problem with the story. So let me take a moment and break the six weeks down for you. And again, I'm going with six weeks because I wanted to give George Martin and EMI the benefit of the doubt. That because the release of Rubber Soul in time for the Christmas buying season for EMI, because there's lots of money involved, that they were going to do everything they possibly could to get at least the initial batch of pressings out into retail. So we know for a fact that they were able to get at least some volume of records out to the stores by December 3rd. And that's what I refer to as the initial batch of pressings. And so they were able to do that in two weeks. So we subtract the two weeks from the six weeks and we're left with four weeks. Now the four week period of time in that six week cycle time takes place before the records can be pressed. So what happens in that four weeks? Well, they have to design and create the labels and the album sleeves. Then the labels and the sleeves have to be proofed. And once they're approved, it goes to printing. And when I talk about the labels, I'm referring to the center labels of the 33 RPM record. And then the album covers and the labels are sent to the plant. So it all seems very straightforward, but Here's the problem, and it's a very big problem for the Rubber Soul narrative. The printing of the center labels and the album jacket cannot begin to be printed until the sequencing of the songs is completed. And the reason for that is because the center labels of the vinyl record contain the names of the songs in sequence or in the order they will play on the record. And the back cover of Rubber Soul like the back cover for just about any record, also contains the names of the songs in the order in which they will play on the record, side A and side B. George Martin did not complete the sequencing until November 16th. And then the very next day, on the 17th of November, we're told that the final lacquer was cut for the mono version of Rubber Soul. Well, if the sequencing of the songs was not finalized until November 16th, then how are the records going to be pressed on the 17th or the latest November 18th? Because we have to remember that the center labels, which contains the name of the songs in sequenced order, are adhered to the vinyl at the same time that the record is being pressed. So that means the center labels and the album jackets had to be in-house prior to when the records were going to be pressed. There was no way that if the sequencing was done on the 16th of November, that George Martin and EMI had the ability to turn around thousands of center labels and thousands of album jackets within a day in order to start pressing the record either on the 17th or the 18th of November. Because again, the center labels are adhered to the vinyl record at the time of pressing. And once the records are pressed, they are packaged with the sleeves immediately. So the center labels and the album jackets had to be in-house and ready to go before the pressing of Rubber Soul commenced, which was either sometime during the 17th of November or the latest the next day, November 18th. So this tells us that the process to print the labels and the album jackets had to have begun weeks before November 17th. And with the process beginning weeks before the 17th of November means that the names of the songs, the run times, and the sequencing of the songs was already known weeks before. Okay, so with slide number 16, let me just summarize what I took you through on the previous chart. So we know that on the 16th of November, George Martin worked out the LP running order. 
which is also referred to as the sequencing. Calculating the runtimes or the length of the songs is required to complete the sequencing. Runtimes are calculated once the final recording of the song is complete, which would include any editing. Sequencing determines the order the songs will be appearing on the record, side A and side B. George Martin completed the sequencing on November 16th, 17 days before Rubber Soul was to be in stores. Without the sequencing completed, the center labels and the album jacket cannot be printed because both the labels and the back of the LP cover contain the names of the songs in playing order. So the question is, how were the center labels and the album sleeves ready by November 17th when the sequencing was completed just one day prior? And the answer is, the names of the songs and runtimes, as well as the sequencing, were known and completed well in advance of November 16th, meaning the labels and album sleeves were already printed with the sequence song titles on standby and ready for when the pressing and packaging process commenced. So how was it possible to get all of this stuff done up front? All of the songs were pre-written and recorded prior to the Beatles entering the studio. Since the songs were already written and recorded, the names of the songs, runtimes, and sequencing were also known. Therefore, the center label and album cover manufacturing process could begin in advance of the Beatles completing the vocal tracks between October 11th and November 11th. Okay, so at this point, I'm sure the question that many of you are asking is, when did the manufacturing process begin for the center labels and the album covers in order to have them in-house by November 17th when the mono lacquer was cut? And I will get to those dates in a moment. But before I do that, I think it's important to revisit the key dates along the Rubber Soul timeline. So we know that the Beatles arrive at EMI Studios on October 11th of 1965. And on November 11th, going into the very early morning hours of November 12th, recording concludes. Then on November 15th, George Martin does the final mix. And then the next day, on November 16th, he does the sequencing. On November 17th, the mono lacquer is cut. And the cutting of the lacquer means that the pressing process can now begin. However, two days later, on the 19th of November, there was a quality issue with the November 17th lacquer, and so they had to recut it. As a side note, records were pressed, copies were made based upon the November 17th mono lacquer. Those copies of Rubber Soul are referred to as the loud cuts, and they are sought after by collectors. And the reason why they're collectible is because not many copies were pressed based upon the November 17th lacquer. So now with the lacquer recut, they can begin the process of creating the stampers, start pressing the records, and to get the initial batch of pressings into the retail outlets by December 3rd. So now let's back up the calendar and figure out when the manufacturing process began for the center labels and the album jackets. So what I'm going to do is to take a look at three cycle times, eight weeks, six weeks, and four weeks. And within each of these cycle times, two weeks is a constant. And the reason why two weeks is a constant is because we know that between November 19th, when they had to recut the mono lacquer, to December 3rd, when they had to have rubber sole in stores, they were able to get the initial pressings of the record out. And from November 19th to December 3rd is 14 days or two weeks. If we go back to November 17th, when the first lacquer was cut, that's 16 days. Now, November 17th is an important date because even though there was a quality issue and they had to recut the lacquer, that was the deadline. That was the day they were shooting for to get the lacquer cut so that they can begin pressing the record. So if we look at the eight-week cycle time and we back out the two weeks for pressing, that says they had six weeks to get the center labels and the album covers manufactured and in-house by November 17th. The 17th was a hard stop 
that was the day that they had to get the mono lacquer cut so that they can begin the pressing process in order to get the records in stores by December 3rd. And even though EMI recut the lacquer two days later, on November 19th, they still pressed records based upon the first lacquer of November 17th. And how do we know that? Because the loud cut version of the album exists. So if we go back to the eight week cycle time, knowing that two weeks is dedicated to getting the initial pressings of Rubber Soul out, that says six weeks was dedicated to creating and delivering the center labels and the album jackets, which means the process started on or around October 8th in order to ensure that the center labels and the album jackets were in-house by November 17th. Now, if we drop down to the six-week cycle time, which is the expedited process, and we apply the same criteria, that says that two weeks is dedicated to getting the initial pressings out to the stores by December 3rd. That leaves four weeks to manufacture the center labels and the album jackets and have them in-house no later than November 17th. And that means the process would have started on or around October 22nd. Then what I did was to create a super expedited cycle time of four weeks. And again, we have to take two weeks out for the pressing process. That leaves us with two weeks for the manufacturing of the center labels and the album jackets. And the four week cycle time says that they would have had to start the manufacturing process on or around November 5th. Now at that point in the studio, the Beatles still had six songs to record. So no matter which scenario we look at, whether it be eight weeks, six weeks, or four weeks, in each case, the names of the songs, the run times, and the sequencing had to have been known. Otherwise, the final center labels and the final album jackets could not have been delivered on or before November 17th. So what this means is if the names of the songs, the run times, and the sequencing were already known, because otherwise you couldn't create the labels and the jackets, that means that the songs were pre-written and pre-recorded. So while the Beatles were in the studio recording the vocal tracks, the process of creating the final center labels and album jacket was well underway. With an eight-week cycle time, it says that the process started on October 8th, three days before the Beatles entered the studio. A six-week cycle time says the process began on or around October 22nd. And the four-week process, as I just mentioned, would have started on or around November 5th. So there is no way the manufacturing process whether it be eight weeks, six weeks, or the super, super expedited time frame of four weeks, began once the sequencing was decided and the lacquer was cut. Because if they did start the process, let's say on November 17th when the lacquer was cut, there is no way Rubber Soul would have been in stores on December 3rd. Now let's take a look at when Rubber Soul would have been in stores if the manufacturing process began right after the sequencing of the songs was finalized and the lacquer was cut. So at the top of the chart, you see a finger pointing to the numbers seven and eight. Number seven is the timeline at six weeks. So if the process began on November 17th when the mono lacquer was cut, then Rubber Soul would have been in stores on December 29th after Christmas. The eight week cycle time would have put the release in stores on January 12th. The four week scenario would have put Rubber Soul in stores on or around December 15th, which is two weeks beyond December 3rd. And obviously, EMI decided that December 3rd was the date in order to capitalize on the Christmas buying season. We talked about how the lacquer was originally cut on the 17th and then it had to be recut on the 19th. And here's the reason why the lacquer had to be recut. Now, Harry Moss was the mastering engineer for EMI. Shortly after the production run, 
EMI decided that Moss had cut the album too loud and ceased production. After Moss recut the mono lacquers on November 19th, new metal parts were made and the pressing of the album resumed. Okay, so that's a little history behind the loud cut. If we go to the bottom left hand side of the chart, let me take you through some time frames to get a feel for how short and how compressed the timeline was. So from the end of recording on November 11th to the release of Rubber Soul on December 3rd, 22 days. From the final mix on November 15th to December 3rd, only 18 days. From when the sequencing was finalized on November 16th to December 3rd, 17 days. From when the original lacquer was cut on November 17th to December 3rd, 16 days. And from when the lacquer was recut on November 19th to December 3rd, only 14 days. So what this is showing is a significant level of time compression within the process, which takes us back to there had to be something going on prior to the Beatles coming into the studio. And that something else is the songs were already written and they were pre-recorded. And therefore, the names of the songs, the run times of the songs, and the sequencing was already known. And because of that, George Martin and EMI were able to begin the process well in advance of the Beatles finishing up recording. And the Beatles were not writing the songs. They were not recording the songs. What they were doing for that 30-day stint for Rubber Soul was learning the vocals in great big batches and then recording them. So George Martin could take the final vocals and mix it down with the instrumental tracks and bring the songs together. So with that, let's move to slide 19 and I will summarize the process. Okay, so how did Rubber Soul really work? And I concluded this was the template that was used throughout the Beatles timeline, but especially during the 1962 through 1966 period. So from Please Please Me through Revolver. So from January 1st through October 10th, the Beatles were finishing up their Christmas shows from the prior year. They recorded the Help album, they did the Help film, and they also had their European and U.S. tours. So while the Beatles were doing all this, George Martin behind the scenes was getting the songs written, arranged, recorded, and mixed. Once he had the songs recorded and mixed, he had the run times and he could do the sequencing. And once the sequencing is known, then the album sleeves and labels can go into production so that the center labels and the sleeves are in-house by the time the Beatles finish up recording the vocals and when EMI is ready to start pressing the records. And remember, the center labels are adhered to the vinyl at the time of pressing, not afterward. Okay, so let me just go through each one of these numbered verticals here to step you through what took place. Step one, George Martin has all of the songs for Rubber Soul written and arranged. Step two, all the Rubber Soul instrumental tracks are recorded by session musicians. Step three, because the songs are already written, that means the names of the songs are known. And because the songs have been recorded by session musicians, this means that the run times of the songs are known. With that information, George Martin can now do the sequencing, which takes us to step number four. Because the sequencing has been established, then the manufacturing process for the center labels and the album jackets can begin to ensure that they are delivered by the time the Beatles finish up recording and EMI is ready to press the records. Now, the first four steps are taking place while the Beatles are doing their thing, finishing up their Christmas shows from the prior year, recording the vocals for help, filming the movie help, and doing their European and American tours. And then once they finish up the American tour, which ended on August 31st of 1965, they have that six-week period of time where they didn't write music, going back to Mark Lewison's book, which then takes them into the studio between the period of October 11th and November 11th of 1965. And that's step number five. And what the Beatles did in that 30-day period of time was to record the vocals and harmonies 
to the existing completed instrumental tracks. And that takes us to step number six, where the final vocals are mixed down with the previously completed instrumental tracks. So we know the Beatles finished up recording the vocals for four songs on November 11th, which actually went into the early morning hours of November 12th. Going to step number seven, with the center labels and the album jackets in-house and waiting for the pressing process to begin, the mono lacquer is cut on November 17th and then recut on the 19th due to a mastering error. Going to step number eight, the final stampers and the initial run of rubber sole is pressed and packaged. And remember, the center labels are adhered to the vinyl at the same time that the record is pressed. And then moving to the last step, step number nine, the initial pressings of rubber sole are delivered to stores in time for the Christmas season. So from October 22nd through December 3rd, this six week period of time, the final mixing of the vocals against the completed instrumental tracks is completed. The lacquer is cut. The records are pressed with the pre-ordered center labels and packaged with the pre-ordered record covers and then sent to distribution to get the records out to retail. So with that, my friends, that concludes this presentation. I hope it was informative. The comment section is open. You guys and gals have a great day and we will talk soon. Thanks for listening. More important, she is an expert at hearing the slightest imperfection on a record surface. And should she find any, a new lacquer master from the original tape is immediately ordered from New York. After audio testing, the mold goes back to the plating tanks. It produces the most important new metal part, the stamper. This completes the cycle. Lacquer to master, master to mold, mold to stamper. The metal buildup to the stamper is exactly the same, except for one thing. The stamper is nearly all pure hard nickel. Its ridges press the playing grooves into the finished record. Now it's prepared for stamping. Ground perfectly smooth on the back. Optically center punched for the record press. Trimmed to exact diameter. And coined. Given a formed edge to grasp the stamping die securely. The record press is a complicated piece of equipment weighing two tons. It molds records by compression. Our stamper is mounted on the top die. Below it, another stamper simultaneously presses the other side of the record. The record compound, the finest pure vinyl obtainable, is fed into the press in granular form. It is forced by hydraulic pressure into a soft plastic in just the right amount for one record. The labels are pressed right into the record. Now we're ready to roll. It has taken many steps and many man hours to get here. But a new record is stamped every few seconds. The record press automatically heats the vinyl plastic for stamping, then automatically cools it, so the record can be played immediately. And here's the first long play copy of Romeo and Juliet. A collector's item? No. The first pressing is always carefully inspected for everything from the correct serial number to perfect centering. Then, still another playback test. And finally, the pressing of the Romeo and Juliet gets going in earnest. And for those who prefer the 45 extended play version, and for the millions of teenagers anxiously awaiting the latest pop hit, an ingenious machine turns them out automatically. It places its own labels, feeds itself the vinyl compound, removes its own records, 
and stacks them already trimmed. And for the fast-growing legions of tape enthusiasts, equally ingenious machines turn out duplicate copies at four times the playback speed to save time, and backwards to save rewinding. And no matter what your taste or preference in music, in the packaging area you discover unlimited variety, the finest in sound and performance.